So welcome back sa Law Student PH. So titingnan natin ngayon si Judge Royolada kung paano siya nakapasa sa bar, paano siya mag-answer ng bar question. Isa daw siyang average student na nahihirapan na mag-memorize ng mga provisions. So anong ginawa niya para maibsan to? Hindi rin siya nag-review sa review center. Pansin niyo the way siya mag-answer ng bar questions. Talagang lawyerly. Tingnan natin. In 2001 remedial law, this is number nine question. So number nine question, an application for a writ of preliminary injunction with a prayer for a temporary restraining order is included in a complaint and filed in a multi-sala RTC consider, consisting of branches one, two, three, and four. Being urgent in nature, the executive judge who was sitting in branch one Upon the filing of the aforesaid application, immediate record is the presence of the judges of branches two, three, and four. The case was raffled to branch four, and judge thereof immediately issued uh, all right, a temporary restraining order. Is the temporary restraining order valid? Why? This is 5%. Okay, this is actually asked. In the bar during my time, and this is the way I answered it. All right, this this was my penmanship. This is the way I composed the question. This is the actual examination notebook that I was able to retrieve. And for that question, uh, I I, I uh, try to underscore some keywords: the preliminary injunction with prayer for. Uh, temporary training order, there is this multi-sala RTC, and there is this raffle of the case to one of the branches. And the case was raffled to branch four and the issuance, immediate issuance of temporary restraining order. So the question was, is the temporary restraining order valid? My answer was no. The temporary restraining order thus issued is invalid. And this is how I, I, I uh, phrased the, the uh, legal basis. The rules of court explicitly provide, it must be provides, but I said uh, some grammatical lapses. The rules of court explicitly provide that the executive judge may in proper cases issue a temporary restraining order prior to the raffle, which is effective for 72 hours. However, if the case has already been raffled, the appropriate court must conduct a hearing before it can issue TRO which is effective for 20 days, including the period when the first TRO was issued. So this is the law that I was able to appreciate. This is not the exact provision of the law, but I just paraphrase it because it's how I understood it. And so I concluded it. The court, therefore, in the case at bar, should have first, should have first conducted the requisite hearing before its issuance of the TRO. It's complete. And I tried to uh, consult the suggested answer for this question, and it nearly replicates the suggested answer. And so I presented it to you so that you know how a bar question in my level uh, would be answered in a way like this. Okay? So this is uh, number nine question in remedial law during my time. Now, another. In remedial law, also, uh, this is number 14. How should the records of child and family cases in family court or RTC designated by the Supreme Court to handle family cases be treated and dealt with? And under what conditions may the identity of child and family cases be divulged? These are uh, asked. It's a simple question, but uh, it calls for some answers that will uh, uh, demonstrate your knowledge on how a family or the records in the family court is uh, being treated. All right, so this is my answer. It's quite long, but this is up to this. Only one page of my examination notebook. So the records treated or dealt with. So I said, in this question, the records of child and family cases in the custody of courts is signated by the Supreme Court to handle family court cases. See, I just repeated the question, which should be which uh, should be treated and dealt with, with utmost confidentiality. I, I, I uh, committed an error in writing utmost, 
but this is the the required uh, manner of erasing your your mistake just underline it only one line not not two lines because two lines will be marking your paper consistent if you are mistaken just strike it out one line at most as such they should not be divulged to the public now under what conditions the identity of the parties in child and family cases be divulged under the following conditions so i am just trying to make myself responsive to the question a when in furtherance of justice which says records affect the substantive rights of third parties and b when such records are necessary for the proper adjudication of a case so this is simply the way i answered it and i said it nearly replicates also the the suggested answers in the bar next uh, this is quite long and uh, if the the question would be this quite long uh, you needed time to at least analyze the problem but i'm just saying to you and the answers that i have given in order that you will be confident enough to write down your own answers that is not necessarily long that is not necessarily so much of words only those words that are actually necessary and appropriate uh, that is responsive to the question that you should employ okay no no surpluses no unnecessary terms so you should aim for that uh, for that clarity and purpose all right here the remedial law question in number 2 during our bar is Josefa Josefa filed in the municipal trial court of Alicia and Mabini a petition for the probate will of her husband Martin who died in the municipality of Alicia the residence of the spouses the probable value of the estate, which consisted mainly of a house and lot, was placed at 95000 and in the petition for the allowance of will, attorney's fees in the amount of 10000 litigation expenses in the amount of 5000 and costs were included. Pedro, the next of kin of Martin, filed an opposition to the probate of will on the ground that the total amount included in the relief of the petition is more than 100000 the maximum jurisdictional amount for the municipal trial, uh, municipal circuit trial courts, the court overruled the opposition and proceeded to hear the case. Was the municipal circuit trial court correct in its ruling? Why? There are surpluses here. If you are not careful enough to analyze this question, you would be distracted by uh, by Alicia and Mabini petition for probate of the will, the filing of case in the residence of the spouses, etc. See, but. Here, the question is only the ruling of the municipal trial court in taking cognizance of the case when the value is 100,000. So this is more of a question about jurisdiction of the court, uh, jurisdiction uh, as to the rest, okay? The jurisdiction of the subject matter because that is provided for by law. So was the municipal trial court correct in its ruling and why? Now, this is how I answered it. Okay, the, my answer was yes. The case is well within the jurisdiction of the Municipal Circuit Trial Court. See again, I just repeated what was stated in the, in the, uh, in the question because that is all that I could use. But here, I was so confident to cite under Batas Pambansa 129, I, I wrote the full, uh, the full uh, uh, title of the law, but as from as amended, the test of jurisdiction and matters of probate will is the assessed value or probable value of the state, which was formerly not exceeding 100,000, now 20,000. Actually, this discussion, this discussion in the latter part is just demonstrating my knowledge of jurisdiction. But you see here, uh, my friends, this is no longer necessary in the answer. Actually, you could have shortened it by only uh, trying to uh, cite that it is formally not exceeding 100,000, not, not, not 200,000 for pro property outside Metro Manila, period. I just made surplusage because, uh, as I have told you, I just would like to show how I know these uh, uh, jurisdictional requirements. Now, in my conclusion, I said said amount was exclusive of attorney's fees, expenses, and costs. So what matters was this yes, and the case is well within the jurisdiction of the municipal trial court that earned me points for this for this uh, kind of question number two. Okay, so 
there you are. I may not have been so responsive with this, but uh, I, I believe they have appreciated my way of trying to cite something that will demonstrate my knowledge of jurisdiction at that time. All right, again, in, in question number three, Petitioner Fabian was appointed election registrar of the municipality of Sevilla, supposedly to replace the respondent election registrar, Pablo, who was transferred to another municipality without his consent and who refused to accept his offers in transfer, much less to vacate his position in Bago Town as election registrar. As in fact, he continued to occupy his aforesaid position and exercise his function there too. Petitioner Fabian then filed a petition for mandamus against Pablo, but the trial court dismissed Fabian's petition contending that co warranto is the proper remedy. Is the court correct in its ruling? Now, this question will, will uh, require you to assemble your uh, understanding of what co warranto and what mandamus petition uh, are all about, okay? So your knowledge of the law again should uh, come into play here. And this is how I phrase my answer. My answer was, yes, who warrant to is the proper remedy when the qualification to hold a certain public office is under consideration. So I made a complete sentence, sentence here and my sentence is quite under consideration, these are, uh, these are sentences out of my blue. I just phrase it this way. Now, I applied the law into the facts and said the fact that Pablo was occupying a position in defiance to a lawful order of the superior to vacate the same and assume his new post and that Fabian is legally entitled to such position which Pablo persistently occupies, the remedy of co at the instant at the instance of Fabian is availing in the case at bar. So you see, it's just, it's just only how you, you try to phrase up your question, your, your, your command, your command, your control of uh, your expression is very much important in order for you to uh, uh, become a responsive uh, examiner or examinee. In, in this uh, uh, particular undertaking. So there, so it is important that you have with you a certain uh, knack of trying to express yourself and trying to express yourself clearly. And this actually earned me points also, okay? Now, uh, remedial law, the prosecution filed an information against Jose for slight physical injuries, alleging the acts constituting the offense but without any more alleging that it was committed that process unlawful entry in the complainant's abode. Was the information correctly prepared by the prosecution? See here, when I answered this, I just repeated what was asked again. I said, no, the information was incorrectly prepared by the prosecution. That was my rejoinder. I merely contradicted the uh, uh, one asked in the question, so the information was incorrectly prepared by the prosecution. And then here, under the revised rules on criminal procedure, again, this is a citing law, the complaint or information must allege, among others, the aggravating or qualifying circumstances attendant to the commission of the offense. Otherwise, such circumstances will not be taken into account in the rendition of judgment. I just made this up. You will remember that I, will, I just made it, this up. This is uh, 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 not included in the provision of the law, but I just made this up because this is what I understood about the law. This is my appreciation of the legal principle. And so I paraphrase it this way. Now, the prosecution, therefore, in conclusion, and I said, the prosecution, therefore, should have alleged, along with the acts constituting slight physical injuries, the aggravating circumstance of unlawful entry in complainants' abode. So I merely reiterated. Just, just to wrap up my answer here. And this is enough. This is enough. Nothing more, nothing less in the answer. All right? So this is how it is phrased. So remedial law again. Uh, uh, Pedro filed complaint against Lucio for recovery of sum of money based on a promissory note executed by Lucio. 
In his complaint, Pedro alleged that although the promissory note says that it is payable within 120 days, the truth is that the note is payable immediately after 90 days, but that if Pedro is willing, he may, upon request of Lucio, give the latter up to 180 days to pay the note. During the hearing, Pedro testified that the truth is that the agreement between him and Lucio is for the latter to pay immediately after 90 days' time. Also, since the original note was with Lucio and the latter would not surrender to Pedro, the original note which Lucio kept in a place about one district from where he received the notice to produce the note, and in spite of such notice, to produce the same within six hours from receipt of such notice, Lucio failed to do so. So Lucio does not want to produce the note. So Pedro presented a copy of the note, which was executed at the same time as the original and with identical contents. All right, so there are things that you have to remember here. The, the presentation of the copy of the note and that uh, whether uh, there is this, there is this uh, uh, way to testify on uh, such a, a, an agreement between the parties. So the question was, there, there, are sub, uh, there, there is a sub-question. There is a sub-question here. Over the objection of Lucio, will Pedro be allowed to testify as a true agreement or contents of the promissory note? And B, over the objection of Lucio, can Pedro present a copy of the promissory note and have it admitted as valid evidence in favor? Why? 5%. 5%. All right? So what will come into play in this particular uh, question is your knowledge of, of evidence, parole evidence, more particularly. So how I answer this? I answer this lengthily because of the, le the, the length of the question also. But then I did not... Uh, answer this in a way that it will consume a lot of uh, examination space. As much as possible, I, I try to be uh, direct in my answers. So here, first first question, yes. First question was over the objection of Lucio, will Pedro be allowed to testify as to the true agreement? My answer was yes, Pedro could testify as to the true agreement or contents of the promissory note. So plus touch, okay? I may repeat what was asked, but then, that would be perhaps necessary in order to uh, uh, have something to write on. But I should have said yes. And then after that, under the parole evidence rule, that, that one, uh, uh, immediately, if the agreement is reduced to writing, it is considered to have contained all the terms agreed upon. And there can be no more evidence between the parties as their successors in interest, except the agreement itself. However, a party may explain, modify, or add the terms if he puts as an issue in his pleading, among others, the failure of the instrument to express the true intent of the parties thereto. And so I concluded, therefore, Pedro, having validly alleged in his pleading the true intent upon the terms of the agreement, he could validly testify thereon. And then the next question was, can Pedro present the, the copy of the promissory note? I said again, yes, the matter under consideration is the agreement between the parties and not the promissory note itself. Moreover, the copy presented may be validly considered as an original of the document. If you're going to evaluate the, the penmanship that uh, uh, is involved in this particular answer, you will see my confidence in writing my answer. I did not hesitate to uh, state whatever I know about the law at the time. And then uh, try to be as much as possible uh, responsive to the questions being asked. And so this was the answers that I gave. And it uh, gave me a point that uh, is enough for me to pass the bar. All right. Uh, this is now remedial law again. Mario was declared in default, but before judgment was rendered, he decided to file motion to set aside the order of default. What should Mari state in his motion to justify the setting aside the order of default? What forms uh, such a motion be? Now, in this uh, particular question, this was the, the answer I, I gave. It's very short, okay? I said, in setting aside the order of default, Mari should have alleged that his failure to answer was due to, to a fraud or to fraud, mistake, accident, or excusable negations, and that he has a meritorious defense. This is how I phrase it. I, I committed a mistake. I un underlined it. I, I, I struck it with a line. And then what, what form should such motion be? Such motion should be in the form of an affidavit, otherwise known as affidavit of merit. This is wrong. The, the, question, the answer here should be, such motion should be under oath. 
That's all. And that is bar exams. This, this is the last number 20, the last item in that bar. If you are going to look into your paper later on, at the end of uh, at the end of uh, your answer, there is this uh, stamp mark for examination 2021 uh, to prove that it is a genuine kind of examination notebook. So this is how I answered it. Okay, this is how it is phrased. Now, uh, I would like to present to you some of the uh, in, in remedial law. I do not know how much uh, points were awarded to us. I do not know. I have no idea. I, I completely have no idea about how much did I earn in each question that I got. But here in, in uh, mercantile law, there are points allotted. So I know whether I got the full point of five, the full point of two or three in that, uh, in that case. Okay? So, uh, all right, all right. So here is the question in Mer Mercantile Law number two, question number two. All right, XY is a rec recreational club which was organized to operate a golf course for its members with an original authorized capital stock of 100 million. The articles of incorporation nor the bylaws did not provide for distribution of dividends, although, there is a provision that after its dissolution, the assets shall be given to a charitable corporation. Is XY a stock corporation? This is corporate law, okay? Corporation code. Give the reasons for your answers. And this is up, this was actually asked as question number two during our time. This was my answer. All right. My answer was no. XY is a non-stock corporation. From the given facts, it may be inferred that the members do not expect a possible return of their investments in the form of profits. They are otherwise expecting enjoyment of particular privileges, benefits, or other forms of services. Moreover, a provision that after its dissolution, the asset shall be given to charitable corporation characterizes its being a non-stock corporation. This was my answer. And on top of that answer class, you see the, the point five there, that was the point uh, given for these answers that I gave. So I got, I got the right answer. I hit the nail right in the head by providing this answer because I was given five. All right. So that was number, number two. Number seven, A, is the registered owner of a stock cert certificate number something. He entrusted the possession of said certificate to his best friend B, who borrowed the said endorsed certificate to support his application for, for passport for a purpose other than transfer. But B sold the certificate to X, a bona fide purchaser who relied on the endorsed certificates and believed him to be the owner thereof. Can he claim the shares of his stock from X? Explain. Would your answer be the same if A lost the stock certificate in question or if it was stolen from him? Okay, this was my answer. You see, the, the, the question calls for two so questions, three for the first and two for the second. So my answer was no. The act of A in delivering the certificate to B and endorsing the same would constitute a valid transfer whereby B would acquire rights therefrom. The transfer being valid, B therefore, uh, B therefore transfer X would acquire valid title thereto, and A would be precluded from claiming the shares of his stocks. So, for, by, by giving that answer, I, I got the complete point of three. And for number, letter B, no. And I got two. So, all in all, five again. If A lost the stock certificate in question, or if it was stolen from him, the transfer of such certificate could not be a transfer in good faith, especially when the facts and circumstances of such laws were revealed and established in accordance with law. Uh, I am not satisfied with, with the, the last portion of this answer, but then uh, perhaps the way I phrase it uh, created an impression on the part of the examiner to give me the whole point of five for this uh, uh, question and answers that I gave. So this is how you phrase it. You know, uh, in, your, in your reading of law, uh, for, for example, mercantile law, these are the words that you should say, endorsement, transfer, 
precluded. These are words that will uh, evince your being a a uh, a potential bar candidate because you know how to phrase sentences with legal swing. You you remember that you should know how to rephrase or phrase sentences with legal swing, just like what I did before, all right? So again, in question number 10, plaintiffs file a collection action against X corporation upon the execution of course decision. X corporation was found to be without assets. Thereafter, plaintiffs file an action against its present and past stockholder Y corporation, which owns substantially all the stocks of X corporation. The two corporations have the same board of directors and Y Corporation finance operation of X Corporation. So here, you already have idea if you have your reading of uh, American uh, uh, Corporation Code, uh, a situation when there is a necessity for pursing the bill of corporate fiction. That is uh, what uh, is being discussed in Corporation Code. The question was, may X Corporation be held liable for the debts of X Corporation? So practically, this calls for the propriety or impropriety of pursing the bill of corporate fiction. And here, my answer was yes, under the doctrine of pursing the bill of corporate entity. So I, I uh, made a straightforward rejoinder. Well, the law generally regards corporation as a separate legal entity from its stakeholders. Such rule may be disregarded when used to perpetrate crime or protect fraud. In such cases, stakeholders may be held liable. A substantial owner, so now I am now applying this law to the facts given. A substantial owner of shares of stocks of its corporation, whose members of, of the board of directors are the same with it, Y Corporation cannot deny that it is an alter ego of X and therefore liable to X obligation. This is how I compose it. And I got a score of five. Full point for this uh, question. All right, question number 14. X, Y, Z signed a promissory note in favor of A, stating that we promised to pay A on December 31, 2001, the sum of 5,000. When the note fell due, A sued X and Y, who put up the defense that A should have been implemented. I should have, A should have implemented Z. Is the defense valid? All right, five points. My answer was no. X, Y, and Z made themselves solidarity liable. So, again calling on the principle of solidarity liability on the note and therefore creditor may hold any of them liable on the instrument for its entire value. This is my appreciation of the concept of uh, solidarity liability when the time I, I was uh, attending law school. And so uh, it paid in this uh, uh, answer. This is without prejudice on the part of the uh, paying solidarity a uh, debtor to recover the respective shares of the co-debtor. And I was given again a full point of five in this question. Again, here again, the law on secrecy of bank's deposit, otherwise known as I-405. Now, class, I am showing this to you, how I phrased the answer, because uh, I would like you to understand that there is no com complexity of uh, answering bar question other than your own technique of answering directly the question in the bar and then making rejoinders that is appropriate to your answer and then citing the law, the provision of the law uh, and, and how you paraphrase it is uh, greatly important in this aspect, okay? So here again, it's all about the notice of garnishment served on the bank, whether it is uh, a violation of the bank secrecy law. So uh, with this question, my answer was, say I, I committed mistake in, in, in numbering, I struck it down with one line. My answer was no. The notice of garnishment concerning deposit is a part of the process of executing a valid judgment. Of course, is this a, a, an answer, a rejoinder that is taken from the law itself? It may be, but this is not the exact provision of the law. I am just paraphrasing the law in trying to justify my answer. So. Further, among the exceptions under the law for the non-disclosure of deposits include an instance when such deposits became a subject of a litigation. The issuance of notice of garnishment against a deposit converts a deposit as a subject of litigation and therefore not covered by bank secrecy law. Is this uh, the actual wording of the law in the provision of bank secrecy law? No, of course not. 
but I just paraphrased it just to show that and I understood the provision of the law involved in this particular uh, matter, this aspect of trying to show my understanding of what garnishment and back secrecy law is all about. And I was given the full point for this. It's again five points. Okay. So this one about insurance, non-medical insurance. Okay. Now, uh, this is very interesting because the insurer, the insured, the insured did not inform the insurer that one week prior to his application for insurance, he was examined and confined at the St. Luke's Hospital where he was diagnosed for lung cancer. So uh, those out of you there who are uh, uh, who already studied insurance law, you know this uh, principle of non-disclosure, okay? Non-disclosure, material disclosure, um, material concealment, rather, material concealment. This is the principle of material concealment, okay? So the insured here soon thereafter died on a plane crash. It is not related to lung cancer, but then he made a material concealment in his application for insurance because he was confined at St. Luke Medical Center for lung cancer. He made a material disclosure. Now, the question was, is the insurer liable considering the fact concealed has no bearing with the cause of death of the insured? So here is how I answered it. No. So I said, such disclosure, there is no way for me to put none again here. So such disclosure is wrong. Such non-disclosure of the actual health status of the insured constitute material concealment, which entitles the insurer to rescind the contract of insurance. The concealment deprived the insurer proper appraisal of the risk to response to reasonable and appropriate premiums. However, notwithstanding such non-disclosure, so I inoculated none because there is no more space for me to write none or just repeat again this mistake I committed beforehand or material concealment, the insurer may still be held liable on the policy if the insured died after the contestability period of two years from the effectivity of the policy. Is this the exact provision of the law? Of course not. But then there are keywords here that I was able to incorporate in my answers. First, material concealment. The, the, the concept of material concealment, the deprivation of the insurer of the proper appraisal, the risk, reasonable appropriate premium. These are terms which during the time that I was reading law uh, stuck into my mind and that it could, I could not get off myself these uh, words. Whenever I encountered insurance uh, matters, these are words that are playing in my mind. And so I was able to cite them here, mention them here. So, uh, policy, insured, contestability period. How would I know this? These are just uh, the, the substance or essence of the provisions of the law on material concealment or under the insurance code. But these are not the exact words there. I just paraphrase all of them in order to present my answer and make myself clear in a way. Okay, so this is number 16, and I got four points for this answer, five points. Again, in number 17, JQ, all of condominium unit insured the same against fire with XYZ Insurance Corporation and made the loss payable to his brother, MLQ. In case of loss by fire of said condominium unit, who may recover from the fire insurance policy? It's eight reasons for your answer. This is a direct, direct question. It's a direct question. Who may recover on the fire insurance policy? Fire policy state the reasons, and this is the the straight answer I gave. And I, I I learned five points again here. GQ is the one entitled to recover on the policy for being the owner of the insured property. It is GQ who has insurable interest. Again, what is the word insurable interest in the insured condominium unit? And this is the key word that the examiner uh, perhaps was looking for in this particular answer. And once he encountered that, he knows immediately that the, the uh, one making the answer knows what he's talking about. So under the law, this is now citation of law, the insurance contract shall be enforceable only to those who have insurable interest therein. This is, I just made this up. This is not uh, what the exact law is uh, all about. 
since MLQ has no insurable interest in the policy, so now I am trying to wrap up my answers with a conclusion that since MLQ has no insurable interest in the property in the case at bar, he cannot recover any proceeds of the policy. So proceeds of the policy. Again, this is a term that uh, I, I am so I, I was supposed to remember whenever insurance uh, matter is concerned. So that's number 17, not 19. So we are near the, the, the last. Suppose A is the owner of several inactive securities. This is again corporation code to create an appearance of active trading for such securities. A connives with B, by which A will offer for sale some of his securities and B will buy them in a certain fixed price. With the understanding that although there would be an apparent sale, A will retain the beneficial ownership thereof. Sub questions A and B is, is the arrangement lawful? If the sale materializes, what is it, was, what, uh, is it called? Now, this calls for, although it, is, uh, it has some, some question, this calls for direct answer. And so this is how I answered it. Very short. Very short. So three points for A, two points for B. I said, no, such, such transaction, I, I was direct here because it was a direct answer, would constitute a fraudulent manipulation of stocks, which is prohibited by the Securities Regulation Code. This is all that I could say because they are asking whether the arrangement is lawful. So there is no more need to cite all the facts, to relate all the facts. I, gave, I got three, the four points here. And in, in letter B, the sub-question, uh, if the sale materializes, what uh, is it called? Direct. If the sale materializes, it is called wash sale. And this is four points, two points. So five for this again. All right, uh, for all these examples I have given you, I said so that you have confidence to paraphrase your answers and make them relatable to your first conclusion and then uh, make your wrap up your conclusion in the second portion or the last portion when you try to make an impact. This is what I got for remedial law and for mercantile law. These uh, uh, law subjects actually are law uh, subjects that are, are the water loose, one of the water loose of uh, Yupang students during my time. Most of the students fail in remedial law and commercial law. They do not make it there. And so uh, they have failing grades. Remember, remedial law is 20% and uh, mercantile law is uh, 15%. So they, they ate a lot of percentage, okay? Uh, there are other bar subjects that I may share with you, but I do not have any more the luxury of time to continue with this, with this uh, topic other than the examples that I have given. And so I was able to get the grade of, in, in remedial law, I was given a grade of 86, and in mercantile law, I was given a grade of 88. Something that perhaps if I was so consistent enough with uh, my, my grade, I would have landed in, in, in uh, uh, a, what you call this, a commendable, commendable position or rank in the bar exams. But 86 and 88 for mercantile law and remedial law uh, are uh, just more than enough to tide me over this examination, okay? So uh, those examples I have given you are actually my actual answers in the bar, and this is the actual result of these answers. So uh, in a way, I believe that I am making my point straight, that you do not have to really memorize the law. You do not have to make an elaborate discussion of the law, simple enough, with all these transition words that I, I told you, with all this uh, 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 grammatical soundness that I told you, it's more than enough for you to hurdle the bar. And as I have said, uh, as you pray, you pray hard. And also you work hard. Working and praying must be given the same intensity. Do not pray alone. Please work so hard also as you pray so hard. Because these two will go together to give you confidence, to give you humility, and to give you what it takes to pass the 2021 bar examination or other bar examinations that may come your way. All right, so 
my friends, with that, I thank you for giving your time uh, for this uh, topic. And uh, uh, I wish you luck for the 2021 bar examinations. Thank you so much. Uh, okay. Thank you so much, Judge Mamilo Riolada.